When you have expectations like Nebraska fans do and USC fans do, it's only natural to maybe question some things a little bit after an early season loss. But is there legitimate concern right now for the Huskers or the Trojans? From L.A. to Piscataway, all Big Ten all year long. This is Big Ten Ten. Let's get this out of the way right away. The Nebraska Cornhuskers and the USC Trojans were good to really good football teams before this past week. The Nebraska Cornhuskers and the USC Trojans are still good to really good football teams following their loss this past week. Because look at the teams that they played. These are both two teams ranked in the top 19 of the AP poll this week. The Big Ten if you haven't checked, is a really deep conference. The Big Ten has a lot of good to really good football teams. And I think Illinois and Michigan are certainly in that category of good to really good football teams. And if you look at both of these games for USC and Nebraska, they lost by a razor thin margin. Unless you're the elite of the elite, that being Ohio State and Oregon, certainly at the top of the conference, and they might even be victim to this this season as well, right? You're going to take a loss like this. This is what an 18-team Big Ten is all about. It is going to be a battle and a war of attrition year in and year out, and you're going to take some lumps. And it's all about how you respond to those losses as to how you're going to finish and how you're going to be able to weather the storm throughout an entire Big Ten football season. And here's the beauty of it, right? If you have expectations to be playing for a championship at the end of the season, one loss is not going to break your year, okay? The 12-team college football playoff allows for maybe some, some bumps along the road and for you to overcome adversity and still be playing your best at the end of the season to be able to get into the postseason, to be able to get hot, and to be able to make a run maybe towards a national championship when all is said and done. These teams are good. Nobody's pushing any panic button. I don't think there's a high level of concern. There might not even be a medium level of concern. I think if there are concerns for Nebraska and USC, which we're going to get into, they're more low level. They're more tweaks right now. Let's start first with the Nebraska Cornhuskers when we talk about the questions, question marks, concerns that might exist within this team. I want to first start with Dylan Raiola. This is not a concern. It will lead into maybe a concern here for the Nebraska Cornhuskers right now. I think Dylan Raiola is being judged at a very high scale right now. And you look at the hype, you look at the talent, you can understand why. I heard a lot of people after this game against Illinois says, well, you know, towards the end, he really played like an 18 year old. Well, he really played like a true freshman, right? Towards the end there. And I know that overtime was not good for anything in red, certainly. And you maybe saw some of those things really come up. But if you look at the entire body of work for Dylan Raiola, in his first Big Ten game against a good Big Ten defense that specialized in creating havoc and creating turnovers, Dylan protected the football pretty well. His one turnover, his one interception, was a jump ball that he put in a really good spot for his receiver, and the Illinois defensive back just wrestled it away and made an outstanding play. I think when you look at the entire body of work, Like when you look at Dylan Raiola, you can't just, I know that's crunch time and I know that's what he's going to have to play well in those spots throughout this season. No doubt there are going to be close games that Nebraska is going to be in and he's got to be able to make some of those plays down the stretch. But if you look at the entire body of work in this game against Illinois, I thought Dylan Raiola played a pretty good game considering that he is a true freshman. I think that he is leaps and bounds ahead where of 97% of other true freshmen that would be at this point in time. I'd be very curious to see maybe how someone like Daniel Kalen on this Nebraska team would have played in that particular situation, or really any other true freshman would have played in that spot. I thought he did, for the most part, what he needed to do for Nebraska to be able to win that football game. He missed one throw. At the end of the game, he puts one more yard of air under that ball, and I think we're talking about Dylan Raiola getting a big, big 10 win over a tough-ranked team in his first big 10 start 
I think Dylan Raiola is going to get a lot better after this week, right? He's seen a Big Ten defense, a good big Big Ten defense. He played pretty well, and now he's going to be able to certainly take a lot from this and be able to improve. We say all of that. But now we kind of go into maybe a little bit of a concern level for the Nebraska Cornhuskers right now, and it's up front on that offensive line. I think you got to figure things out up front because beginning of the season, you were looking at Teddy Prohaska to be the starting left tackle. He goes out in fall camp, and now during this game, Turner Corcoran goes out with an injury. Matt Rule says, yeah, Turner's going to be out for a while uh, with a hamstring injury. So now you're really shuffling th- some things up. They rode with Gunnar Gotola, who is a redshirt freshman uh, during this game. Now, this coaching staff really likes Gunnar Gotola. They like the potential that he has and the promise that he has up front. But we're talking about protecting the diamond. We're talking about providing some insurance for Dylan Raiola to continue to be that quarterback down the field that can continue to make plays, right? There are other teams around college football. There are other teams maybe even in the Big Ten Conference that know you need a really good offensive line to protect your asset back there, to know, to really take this team as far as they can go. Now, is it going to be Gunnar Gotola? That's a big time question because that's why I put figure out left tackle because I, it might not be as simple as, well, we lost this guy. It's the next guy in the depth chart, certainly stepping up. How about Micah Mazuka? right? He was kind of held out of the games against Colorado and Northern Illinois for a non-injury related issue. He has played tackle in his career. He is an experienced player on, an, on this offensive line that has experience at power four type of football. I'm very curious to see how the shuffling is going to go on this offensive line to ensure that their pass protection doesn't utterly break down like it did in overtime, which was inexcusable against the Illinois fight in Illini. This Nebraska offensive line worked their nine to five. They clocked out, said, we're not working any overtime. We're just not doing that. And then you saw the results that you saw in that particular football game. So Nebraska needs to find a way to figure things out on this offensive line because if Dylan Raiola, even though he's patient in the pocket, has shown a lot of poise, has shown good escape ability, even though he possesses all of those threats, you can't have him running around back there. They've protected him outside of maybe that Illinois overtime. They've protected him pretty well so far. But some injuries up front, and I talked about this when Teddy Prohaska got injured. Okay, I I said it at the time. I said, well, Turner Corcoran's going to come in, and he's experienced, but if you get an injury or two on top of that, you start to get real thin, and you start to get real young on the offensive line. So we'll see if Matt Rule and Marcus Satterfield can figure things out on the offensive line. Let's talk about defense. Look, I said it at the beginning, right? These are still good to really good football teams. This is still a black shirts type of defense, even though Luke Altmaier was able to move the football through the air. It's not like he completely tore him up, right? He passed for 236 yards. They held Luke Altmaier under 250 yards in this game. And I think Luke Altmaier is a pretty darn good quarterback. I think it's patches that need to be made for this Nebraska defense. Like you don't need to call in a plumber. You don't need to call an electrician. You need to look in the eye and says, Hey, I'm the handyman. I can patch this thing up right now. Uh, Tommy Hill is one Minor concern that might exist right now. Injury is sitting at day-to-day for Tommy Hill. Plantar fasciitis. I've had that injury. It can be annoying. It can be uh, infuriating. It can be lingering uh, as well. So I'm, And he's, he's the guy right? that's going to match up on the top receiver on the other side. He's that lockdown corner uh, type of guy for Nebraska. So if you don't have him... What is the secondary going to look like? We saw maybe what it could look like in this game where Luke Altmaier was able to have success. You look at these teams coming up on the schedule. You have Purdue. After that, you have a team that likes to run the football a little bit more in Rutgers. For me, I think I really want the back end of this defense really patched up by the time they go to Bloomington, Indiana the week before Ohio State. This is an Indiana team that can throw it around just as good as anybody, not only in the Big Ten, but in all of college football. So let's patch some things up by that point in time over these next few weeks. It's a chance to get right next week against Purdue and then continue to get better 
and better uh, after that. Last thing I'll say about Nebraska, and I think eventually that they're going to have to do this, you got to learn how to win, right? You know, you get the blowout win against Colorado, and that was, I think that was big for the psyche of this Nebraska football program. But at some point, you need to learn how to win a close game. Like, you got an upcoming game against Rutgers, which I think is going to be a challenge for Nebraska. I would almost rather be that be a close game right now. I think Nebraska just needs to find a way to win a close game. Let's talk about the USC Trojans now. And I think there's less concern surrounding this USC team than there is surrounding this Nebraska team that I just talked about. I still think USC is a college football playoff caliber team. Look, look at the way that this game ended up against Michigan. Okay. You were down 14 to three at halftime. Maybe, maybe Lincoln Riley teams of the past would not have been able to respond and show the resolve and show the resiliency that this USC team did. I was so impressed with Miller Moss. He was getting knocked down and knocked down and knocked down in that first half. And then in the second half, he popped back up and says, it's going to take a lot more than that, Michigan, to be able to keep number seven in Cardinal and Gold down. I was impressed by the way he and this entire team really stepped up and really responded. They responded right away. And then after the pick six, they were able to respond after that as well. That's what championship level teams do. Okay. They don't fold in the face of adversity. They respond. They are resilient. And this is why I still believe that this USC Trojans, this this team can still accomplish the goals that they have All right, let's talk in about maybe some of these minor concerns that might exist for the USC Trojans right now. And and it's pass protection. And it's this offensive line. Now, they made the switch up at tackle. Elijah Page, I think the concern right now might be with the development of Elijah Page and where he sits and his standing within this USC program. I think coming into the season, Elijah Page was someone that they were really excited about, right? A young kid over there. At tackle, but he just got eaten alive by Josiah Stewart. Now, when they moved Mason Murphy over to left tackle and they brought in a new right tackle, things got better. And then you saw what happened when things got better. Their offense certainly started to go in a positive direction. It certainly started to go in the right direction. But here's the thing about this offensive line. Uh, this is an offensive line that is still going to take on some pretty good fronts this season. They got to play Penn State. They got to play Nebraska. They got to play Notre Dame at the end of the year. So in those big games, and those are the games that you're going to have to win if you want to get in to a 12-team college football playoff. And in those games, you got to be able to protect. You got to be able to contain opposing pass rushes because there are some threats up front on those specific teams that can get after the quarterback. So I think you got some time before Penn State right on October 12th to be able to figure this thing out. I think that's the good thing for, for USC right now. You look at their next two games, they play Wisconsin and they play Minnesota. Winnable games, a couple of maybe get right type of games towards teams in the bottom half of the conference right now. So USC certainly can maybe build some confidence back up on that offensive line, but they've got to figure some things out when they play the better competition in the Big Ten Conference later on in the season. I don't know if I'd call this last point a concern, but maybe it's something that I want to see from USC as these next weeks go on, as we get into the schedule, as we get to some of these bigger games down the road. Um, There are a lot of weapons, uh, no doubt about it, right, on this USC team. But USC suffered a couple of injuries to maybe some of their bigger weapons. You talk first about tight end Lake McCree. I think Lake McCree has been somewhat of a go-to guy for USC at the tight end position this season. He's got the second most targets on the season and the second most catches. Now, it's not as serious as people thought, originally thought that it could be. He's going to be out for a little bit, right? So somebody else is going to have to step up into that type of role to be a go-to guy of sorts. Who's leading USC in targets and receptions right now? It's Zachariah Branch. Now, here's the thing. When you get to a third and seven and a third and eight, and you need to find a guy that needs to make a play. We need a guy to run a precise 
eight to 10 yard out route. We need a guy to go over the middle, make a catch and move, keep on moving the sticks. I'm not sure Zachariah Branch is that guy. Now, Zachariah Branch is an absolute weapon in the open field. There's a reason why people kick away from him in the kick return game and the punt return game. There's a reason why when he catches the football, you take a deep breath because, man, you just don't know what type of electricity that he can provide. He is so, so good in being able to create plays like that. And when they get it to him on offense, it's a lot of screen stuff. It's a lot of short passing game. Hey, let's get it to Zach in the open field and let him create down the field. So I think somebody is going to need to step up the apps. We talk about Makai Lemon also uh, being injured right now. So I think someone's going to need to step up to be that go-to guy of sorts. Who's it going to be when Miller Moss needs a play? Who's going to be able to step up and be that guy? Is it going to be uh, the upperclassman? Is it going to be Kyron Hudson? Is it going to be Jacoby Lane? I would like to see them target Deuce Robinson a lot more this season. He's pretty far down uh, on the targets and receptions list uh, at this per- uh, particular moment in time. So we'll see if he gets a bigger role in this offense. So it is not a concern. It is completely fine if you distribute the football to a bunch of people. And that's what USC has been able to do this year. But I just want to see someone that they can rely on series after series to make big plays to keep on moving the chains forward. This USC team is going to be okay. They're going to be more than okay. The good thing about them is they got weeks to get better before that game against Penn State on October 12th. I want to know what you guys think. What is your concern level? Do you have a concern with the Nebraska Cornhuskers and the USC Trojans. I want to hear all those thoughts in the comments below. It's still early. Take a deep breath, Husker fans, Trojan fans, and I think you know it. You're going to be just fine. You are a couple of really good Big Ten football teams. Leave all your thoughts in the comments below. I'm Big Ten Ted. We will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching Big Ten Ted, where it's all Big Ten all year long. Make sure to like the video to spread the word of Big Ten Ted to the masses and subscribe to the channel for updates on Big Ten content that drops every day.